Hey, here we are again on the uh, Stone Roadie Show, the uh, Craig Reed Stone Roadie Show, the uh, world's most famous stone roadie, Craig Reed. And as you can see, Craig has gone through a time machine and he's a lot younger than he used to be. You're actually looking at Chad Reed, Craig's son. Some of you people that uh, are Skinner fans and you live in the Jacksonville area, you know Chad pretty well. He's been around uh, and there's a lot of things that people don't know about Chad. Chad um, uh, grew up around Leonard Skinner, kind of like uh, they were his babysitters and he was uh, the ring bearer in a lot of them's weddings, uh, like I believe Gary and Billy's and maybe Ronnie's, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we got Chad on here because uh, Craig's taking a little break. He, he got uh, aggravated with some stuff and he was, he was afraid that he was going to say some things that he didn't want to say. So he took himself off for a little while, but he will be back. Um, and so we got Chad on here. Chad uh, lives in the Jacksonville area and he has pretty much most part, most uh, his whole life. Uh, so uh, we're going to just uh, ask Chad some questions and get him to tell some really cool stories because he's got a lot of stories that that I, out of all the people that I know that I've met that were around those guys when uh, uh, when they were around in the early 70s, Chad's got tons of stories and they're really cool ones. And so we're going to get some of those out of here. So, Chad, uh, welcome to the Stone Roadie Show. Uh, how, how's it feel being sitting here and with you and taking your dad's place? Uh, you know, I figure since my dad has his nickname, the Stone Roadie, I'm going to go by the uh, cigarette smoking, beer chugging, fat ass. Um, but now, you know, I kind of I feel a little bit like the Rolling Stones right now, opening up for legends. <laughs> yeah, just, I just hope you don't kick my ass off the stage. That's all. Yeah, the funny thing is, is, is Craig, you know, he's uh, he's Mr. Thin and, you know, he's always talking about fat people and me and Chad both, we're probably, uh, you know, I know I'm at least 15 pounds overweight. I don't smoke, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know, you know, Craig, when you're around him, he doesn't bash you, you know, he just, he makes fun of you on the phone and no, I'm a little bit older. I'll kick his ass now. <laughs> so, what was what was it like growing up uh, as as the Stone Roadie's son? What what uh, what do you remember the first things about the guys in the band Leonard Skinner? What do you remember like your first recollection of Leonard Skinner, and, and mainly who was it you remember the most? Well, you know we we moved. Um, moved to Jacksonville from Ohio and my dad was just a mechanic. And um, I remember the day that we were leaving to come to Jacksonville and the U-Haul the truck and everything else. Um, and we actually left my grandparents' house, I believe. But growing up where I came from, there was, um, you know, my mom had some sisters and a brother and they were all hippies, you know, they were all the same thing. And we grew up on, you know, we, we had a, a lake properties and a, and a nice fancy house in Ohio. Um, we actually, my grandparents owned the mayor's mansion in Canton, Ohio on 44th Street. So when we first moved here, it wasn't a shock to me of, wow, a bunch of long hair guys, you know, playing music and boats and, and uh, you know, water and fishing and and uh, people smoking weed. I mean, that was uh, pretty much my whole life growing up. The um, the first real person that I remember meeting in the band was Leon and Billy were the first two, and then shortly after that, it was. Um, it was uh, Alan because Alan had uh, Amy, which is my age. Actually, uh, Amy's older than I am. I'm still I'm still young. Um, but me and Amy became close, real friends. She uh, real close, or real fast. She had um, a couple of her friends, which is uh, Carol Carroll's daughter. Carol Carroll was married to Big Lou, who was the uh, I think it was a road manager for Robson and Collins. But she hung out with Judy and and all that group. So um, it was it was them at first. 
Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of Leonard Skinner's. I'm not a fan of Leonard Skinner's at all. Um, I listen to their music. I grew up with it. You know, people talk about the different shows they played what year. I have no idea about that stuff. The thing that I do know is about what we did on our personal lives, what we did, swimming pools, fishing holes, boats, uh, riding horses at Gary's. Um, you know, those are the things that I know about. The road was always kind of kept away from us as much as possible. How old so, were you? How old were you when you uh, when you first remembered when they, when you remembered Leon and Billy? Like you said, how old were you think you were? I mean, to me, they're always they're they're there forever. Um, I know we were. I was two and a half, three years old when we moved there. Two and a half, three years old. Dean Dean was another one. I mean, that he's not part of the band, but. You know, when we moved in, we moved into Cedar Cove Apartments and everybody lived there. I mean, everybody lived there. So when we first moved in, it was that whole group that, you know, was over there and hanging out. And uh, Don Barnes from 38 Special, he had a son named Jason. And uh, we hung out, you know, and there that, that was pretty much the group until Artemis came around and he had Chris. And uh, and Gene, Gene Odom's daughter was around some. Do you... Uh... What what was it like with Craig as your father? Was he around like for sporadically? He would leave town and, and yeah. I mean, to to me, when it came to the music business, that that was the time that my dad was leaving. You know, I got to go to work. It wasn't like when he was a mechanic and he'd go to work and I can sit up the window and wait for his motorcycle or his Camaro to pull you know up the street. So it wasn't like that. It was when he went to work, he was gone. You know, and we're talking 200 days out of the year. And, you know, at that point, it became more me, my mom, uh, Kathy Collins, uh, Judy. Um, JoJo was around a lot. Um, well, that not in the early days she wasn't. But that was uh, that was pretty much the group. You know, we when we, we went to the movie theaters and went to Piccadilly restaurant and uh shogun restaurant down on blanding back in the old days but you know that's that's pretty much what it was i mean it was normal life normal going and, and i remember your father telling me a story he said that he got a call from i think your principal at school and and they said hey your son chad is down here telling some lies that you know he knows the band leonard skinner and and your dad had to go down there and said no he's not lying what do you remember anything about that yeah, that was my mom. Um, the first time that happened, I was at Trinity Christian. Um, if I remember right, the 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 band paid for me to go to that school. That's a big, big private school here in Jacksonville. They're huge. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd go there and, and, you know, it's funny because kids would tell me, you know, what's your dad do? Oh, he's in a band. And they go, oh, my dad's in a band too. And I go, really? Which one? And they'd say, uh, circle jerks and i'd go never heard of them you know and, and they go which band your dad and i go leonard skinner and they go oh full crap you know and, and they'd laugh but you know when when i when, when i talk about my dad being in a band and other people would say their dad was in a band too you know i i didn't realize you know because i thought everybody that was in a band did what they did you know so i didn't realize they played for 50 dollars a night at the moose lodge right yeah <laughs> so, so so yeah that, that that was the first time um the second time after the crash and we actually moved to um uh, uh atlantic beach outside of jacksonville beach and it was at beaches chapel and um you know i was always told don't say anything about your dad being in skinner and don't talk about skinner you know what happened last time you're just a liar and it's funny when they found out of what was going on i think they got a check and it was from like the Ross and Tennant Collins band or something. And they're like, whoa, what the hell is this? <laughs> and, uh, you know, they stopped letting me read from the Bible. Oh, wow. Yeah, they were like, oh, man. And the thing about it was, is that was our reading class. We read from the Bible for reading, and then we read from the Bible for Bible study. <laughs> you know? So when when they found that out, they were like, man, you know, this this guy is kind of the, the devil child. That's Leonard Skinner. And it, it even came down. They had a guy one time come out. His name was Rocco Marshall. Me and Rocco were made a close up until the time of his death. 
um, he actually came out to give a speech to the school in this little chapel that they had regarding uh, bands and rock and roll and the devil, you know, and he said, I worked with this band, I worked with that band, and, you know, they all did this, and they all did that, and I'm sitting there thinking, man, this guy brings up Skinner, I'm kicking his ass. Yeah, man, I must have been in the second grade or third grade, I thought, I probably second grade, and uh, sure enough, Larry Skinner came out of his mouth, you know, all the guys are nothing but drug addicts and <laughs> hell raisers, and, you know, Skinner's crazy, and I jumped up and you, you mf her and ran up on the stage and wrapped up his legs and was punching him in his thighs. And, you know, they, they had a, I was talking to my buddy John Wayner the other day and he was like, I'll never forget the time in church. You know, that guy said, Leonard Skinner, you freaked out. You know, come to find out he was the guitar player for Billy and Leon. And they actually locked me in a room because I was punching walls and throwing shit, man. And they locked me in a room like a mad animal and they pretty much you're not coming out until billy and leon gets here and you know billy and leon had to come in and settle me down and say they were friends of his and what what his intentions were you know after that me and me and rock were made really tight for a long time but you know up until his death which was about probably two three years ago well as far as fighting goes uh, you had a pretty good teacher a lot of uh people that seen some of the films that craig did and you're in there uh blonde haired kid little guy wrestling around with ronnie and uh tell me tell me what you remember about when you used to wrestle with ronnie and some of the some of the things that he taught you as far as fighting goes yeah ronnie he, he was no hold bar man he I'd, I'd i'd slap him in the face and he'd say don't slap me you little son bitch ball up your hands and give me a good one that wasn't hard enough you know you got to grab him by the hair of the head and really just start ramming they get a hold you stick your thumb in their ear you know and the horse bit pull their, their their lips back and hit hit them hit them with their lips pulled back it'll rip their lips open and you know that that don't work bite them you know and that got me in trouble because actually in junior high school i bit some kids city off and we, <laughs> it, it got me in trouble a little bit you know them guys were always getting me in trouble dean oh god when dean was alive he was the biggest damn instigator there was man we're we're in hawaii and you know, my mom, don't go out the water, don't go out the water. You go out the water knee deep, you know, and Dean's like, hey, there's a 200 foot high dive over here. Let me pal you out there and see if you'll jump off that thing. You know, and sure enough, my little ass, I, I wasn't going to show him that I was scared. And he, he said, I definitely was going to do that. So I'm up and this is the highest high dive you can think of. And Dean yells out, shoo! You know, my mom looks up and Everybody jumps up and starts running for the water. They're telling me not to jump, and I jumped. And oh boy, they jumped on Dean's ass for that one. <laughs> but you know, they were always instigating me in the shit. You know, I remember you, especially, especially Alan. Alan was the worst. I, I, I was getting, I was getting beat up by some guy at school that was probably about four years older than me. And uh, I, I went to Alan. I said, "Man, Alan, what do I do?" And he said, "Well, when he runs after you, find a big stick and hide behind the tree and him in the knees." I said, "Man, I've done did that." You know, and he said, what's he doing? I said, man, that guy had me go down my hands and knees and told me to kiss his shoes. So what'd you do? I said, I hit him right in the crotch and took off running. You know, and, and he goes, man, you know, it sounds like with this guy, you're going to do what I used to do with Al or with, uh, with uh, Ronnie. You know, just get him tired of beating your ass. You know, <laughs> beating somebody's ass is only funny for so long, you know, but, you know, just, eventually he'll get tired of beating it, but just keep on giving it to him. But, uh, yeah, he, uh, <laughs> that that was his philosophy, you know. He show up drunk, and Ronnie gets pissed, and uh, and beats his ass. Just show up drunker the next day. Eventually, he'll get tired of beating your ass. Well, I guess that it probably helped you in some ways. Whenever you had the bully at school, you didn't you didn't have to worry about uh, getting beat up by the bully too much. You know, after those tips. <laughs> No, I ended up putting a mirror in the back of my locker and put a lead pipe in there, and I watched him come behind me in the mirror. And I turned that lead pipe and cracked him across the jaw and then dumped him over the balcony onto the second, off the second floor. And, you know, at the cafeteria, guy landed on the cafeteria during lunchtime. But he, he, after that, he stopped messing with me. I didn't like Alan's advice, man. When he told me, just keep, let him keep on whipping your ass. Eventually, you'll get tired of it. I, nah, that's not good advice, Alan. What do, you, uh, what do you remember about the Hell House? I know you've got a story about... Uh, when you used to go down to the dock and, and the pickles that uh, you guys used to throw to Wheat pickles. Yeah, tell, tell that story. 
Roddy would always bring me sweet pickles, you know, the, the, the big jars of sweet pickles. And, um, you know, he spent a lot of time out that dock too. And, you know, I'd go out there, get tired of listening too loud inside the place, too damn hot inside that place too. And, uh, you know, we had BB guns and bow and arrows and, you know, I, I, I kind of always got into that. Chris got into the music. He'd sit in there and watch his dad play drums all day. But when you got bored, you know, there were a lot of gators out there and some big bass and everything. <clears throat> you could take sweet pickles and throw them off the dock. And, uh, you know, Ronnie was always, hey, go up there and throw the sweet pickles. Go up there and throw the sweet pickles. You know, now that I got older, I realized that was the you know, way of saying, get the fuck out of my hair. <laughs> yeah. You know, but. I, I remember one time he was out there and, and, and I was throwing the sweet pickles off the dock and the band was inside playing. He's just sitting there thinking. And man, I, I, I could almost swear it was, um, I need you. He was, he was going through the words of, I need you. Um, and I threw a damn pickle off the dock and sure enough, a gator hit that thing. And Ronnie just went, wow, son of a bitch. And turned around and walked back inside, you know, <laughs> it just, he was kind of like, oh, cool. One actually hit him. You know, but my dad later said they used to throw them all the way across the river when they were on the bank, and they'd go in there and get them. So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it wasn't a, you're bothering me, kid. Maybe that, you know, <laughs> he just thought that was fun. If we were highly technical, I would pull up that picture of you and your dad in that boat bad company right there by the dock. You know, that's a, a really cool picture. And Craig, you're sitting in his lap, and you've got the steering wheel. What do you remember? I know, I know that you told me a story about when you guys wrecked that boat, and then, and then uh, you had a little uh, uh, scare of some sort. Well, that wasn't that boat. That was um, Ronnie Crusoe. His his parents owned a marina, and he was really big into speed boats. And uh, I think I think that boat would do like a hundred miles an hour, and we wrecked in there. But you know, bad company. The boat, um, you know, and and Billy had boats too, and. And but that creek that ran back there where the hell house was, you know, at, at Alan was on that thing a lot. Alan could actually ride his, you know, drive his boat to the hell house from his house. You know, he he had he lived back off of Julitson Creek here, and he could just ride that right up there and get in there and ride in the back. So we used that boat a lot just to, you know, get away, go down to Alan's house. Uh, Billy, he eventually being pretty close, I think it was Billy and. Gary, I want to say, lived across the lake from each other. And I remember a couple of times, man, Billy, you guys want to talk about Alan driving cars and all that shit, man. Don't ever get on a boat with Billy. Billy couldn't drive nothing. <laughs> you know, and, and and it would be 2 o'clock in the morning, and we're on a boat crossing the St. John's River, you know, and you had to go, Billy, turn on the goddamn lights, man. You know, and with a drink in his hand and hauling ass across the river to go to somebody else's house. So using that whole intercoastal and, and bad company and the fishing and, you know, we, we take bad company and, you know, pull it behind trailers and go to other lakes and stuff. But, you know, that was just part of the, you know, that, that was part of the home life, the things that did at the home. I, I heard a video with Judy the other day and she said, you know, when the guys were home, you know, they, they were the guys at home that were going to work every day and doing what they were supposed to do. And when they went out the road, you know, we, we didn't get to see that that much every now and then, you know, we got a taste of it. But um, as far as seeing that part that the fans and stuff see, we, they, you know, they were gone for 200 days out of the year. We didn't see that. So when you were around those guys, uh, do you, do you remember any of them being hard on you? Were they like really cool with you or what, uh, how did they treat you? No, oh, they were all hard on us. <laughs> You know, but it, it was a different way, you know. You know, honestly, you know, Gary was probably the most calm with the kids um, until Artemis came along, you know. And, and but you know, Alan and 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 Ronnie and you know, well, Bob was just nuts. Um, but all drummers are. Skinner's had a history of that. <laughs> but you know, you know, the, it, it was. Ronnie was, you know, you're going to be the best boxer in the world. You're going to be the best baseball player in the world. You're going to, you know, it, when you play football and you go to tackle somebody, just don't tackle them to tackle them, tackle them to hurt them, hit them hard, you know. And, uh, you know, Alan, the same way, you know, if, if you're going to ride the bicycle, you're going to jump, make sure you're going as fast as you can to 
to jump as far as you can. And come on, that wasn't fast enough, you little wimp. You know, do it. You know, I mean, to the point, I I actually bit my tongue off of, you know, but bit my tongue off riding a bicycle trying to jump fast and hard. And, you know, most people wouldn't be doing that at four years old, but them guys just pushed you, man. They just always, always pushed you. Uh, as as far as like you said that when they were on the road and they were pretty much gone, but I do know that sometimes because Craig told me that um, maybe it was local gigs or something I don't know, but he said that a lot of times he would sit you on the ground there right by Artemis drum so he could watch you while they were playing, sort of babysitted you. You remember, yeah, you remember any of that? Yeah, and, and, and my hearing doctor hates my dad, man, the guy that does my hearing aid. Uh, you know, <laughs> it wasn't only there. When I got older, he used to set me right up in the back of the PA. You know, I couldn't hear for three days afterwards. Uh, late, later on during the Rossington and Collins day, uh, you know, Alan always threw the guitar to my dad. Always threw the guitar to my dad. And uh, it might have been towards – no, I, I'm pretty sure it was Rossington and Collins, Aaron. But uh, my dad's like, hey, stand right here for me real quick. And he ran back to go grab a spare guitar for Alan. And Alan turned around, looked right at me and chuckled. He just looked right at me and laughed. And my dad has a guitar and he's reaching out for the other guitar. And Alan throws the guitar at me. You know, and it was the Explorer. So I kind of let the guy, you know, I just grabbed it like that. And the neck hit me in the, in the head and gave me that taste of bloody nose in my mouth, you know, and I fell backwards. And my dad just looked at Alan and shook his head and ran out and handed him the, uh, I think it was the Strat, the the black Strat ran out and handed that thing, the black one, the sunburst one. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, the, any anytime they were in Jacksonville, we would go to a few other shows with them if it was close and we'd, you know, meet up. Um, But, you know, the the... The PA thing, man, I'm, I'm deaf as deaf can be. And, and I tell people all the time, I grew up right next to a monitor speak. I did the Hell House, too. And uh, the uh, rehearsal thing that they had uh, downtown, Riverside, Riverside, I think it was. You know, I was always sitting next to Kevin Elson on the soundboard and, you know, sitting next to the speakers. You know, I've only been at a concert one time my whole life that I wasn't backstage. Yeah, uh, tell that that one story of because uh, I just got to notice we've got like about seven minutes left on this Zoom meeting. Um, tell that one story that you were talking about that uh, you got your stage pass pulled. And yeah, yeah. Ross Schilling, uh, the one of the managers for Skinner, he uh, he saw me. I had an all access pass. He said, "Man, you can't have that all access pass, man." That you get a VIP pass. That all access pass is for you know family and 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 important people, kind of you know. And he took it off of me and told me to leave the backstage area. And he'd have somebody bring me another pass. And Johnny was walking by and goes, "What are you doing out here?" I said, hey, "Rush took my VIP pass." And he goes, "Oh hell with that." He took his off and put it around my neck. And he goes inside and got security questioned him on it, you know. And they went and got Ross and they asked Johnny. They said, "Hey." What happened to your, to your pass? And Johnny goes, I gave it to Chad. Well, why? Because you took it away from him. Well, Johnny, what happens if they throw you out? And you go, oh, I guess there won't be a show then. <laughs> right. you know, but he's keeping the pass. We've got a lot more uh, stuff that we want to talk about. We're going to get you back on. And, and I think once we get back on uh, – I know you remember a lot of stuff that happened after the plane crash around Allen when he was paralyzed and, and you got a lot of great Allen stories and things like that. So uh, we're going to have to go ahead and wrap it up because we're going to run out of here at uh, uh, a time and it's going to just end. So we appreciate you coming on and we're going to have you back on if, if, uh, if you don't mind. <laughs> So uh, thanks for coming on, Chad, and uh, we'll have you back, and we really appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you coming on. No problem, guys. So until next time, this is the Stone Roadie Show, and we're out. <laughs>